Okay, so I'll just welcome everyone. Robin has this great idea that uh, people should be given an opportunity to put me on the hot seat after a Sunday sermon. We've invited Kathy to bring some questions to the table, and Kathy very kindly offered an invitation to Wendy. I've never really <laughs> met Wendy before ever. No. I'm delighted to meet her. It's the first time we're having a conversation, and we're unpacking the sermon from Sunday's Gospel on Mark, uh, something about the rich going through the, the rich eye comes of to a church. needle. Yes. That's right. Oh, the rich one comes to church. That's right. Yes. Yeah. Yep. So starting with that, we live in a really rich country. So how do Australians aspire to ever achieving this? Achieving eternal life. Hmm. So how do rich people aspire to achieving eternal life? Well, well that's well, a great... Well, not aspire, but how do they... How do they potentially achieve it? Yeah. So that's actually a great question because that's precisely the question that the rich man asked. So I think what I tried to communicate was we make a mistake if we read the scripture in an individualistic fashion as applying to me as a person because we have that very individualistic approach to life and society. We share that with North America, I think. Uh, whereas I'm imagining that the early writers of the gospel and the early audience, and certainly my cultural background, is more community orientated. So it's a community hearing and interpreting the text. Mm -hmm. And it's not so much about eternal life. It's about this, this thing that Jesus calls the kingdom of God. So that in itself is a political statement because he could have used anything. He could have said something like the new household of God or the new city of God, but no, he chooses this phrase, the new kingdom of God. So the early listeners would know what a kingdom is. They mm -hmm. live in a kingdom. They know how it operates. And what Jesus is communicating, that he is inviting us uh, to live in the kingdom with a different set of rules that operates differently. So this is about entry into the kingdom of God. And one of the main features of the kingdom of God, uh, based on the teachings of Jesus, and remember he's a good Jewish person, so he's inspired by his Jewish tradition. One of the main features of it is is, I suppose, uh, the, the whole element of sharing. So it might start even with his birth, so the, the time he's born, um, his mother is said to have sung the song over him, which is quite a political song too. She says, the rich he has sent away empty and the hungry he has filled with good things. And so the idea is that the rich so inspired by this concept of the kingdom of God, so invested in it and so desiring to be a part of it, they're given a great healing. And the great healing is to be free from affluenza, always wanting more. You, you healed of the disease of consuming and concentrating your wealth. And you see your wealth as an aspect of the kingdom of God. So it's, it's shared. So the reason there are no rich in the kingdom of God is, pre is precisely for the reason that there's no poor in the kingdom of God. Um, there's, it's kind of a great leveling of society. So Jesus is basing this teaching on two influences. And the one influence is something called um, the whole Sabbath idea. So I, I don't know if you're aware of Sabbath, but the word Sabbath usually implies a day of rest. Mm -hmm. So once, once a week, there's a day of total rest. So that gives you a taste of freedom. And this can be the most life-changing thing that people can ever do, is to give themselves a day of rest. Because guess what happens in that day of rest? You stop doing, so you've got time to think and reflect. You know, and then out of that, um, all kinds of things happen. But it was further than that. So it's to do with the number seven. So every seven years, fields would be allowed to go fallow. It's an agricultural principle which we find helpful today. Mm -hmm. So the fields are rewilded. They're left to 
be undomesticated, be themselves. And the idea is that that happens to humans as well. So the ideal society is when the, the gap between rich and poor is, is small. The larger the gap between the rich and poor, the more unstable a society is, the more violent um, it is. So the early Jewish people didn't trust themselves to keep society in this balance. And so they had this idea that every seven times seven years, so in every, every 49th year, all debts would be cancelled and slaves would be set free and loans would be forgiven. And this was the great equalization of society um, again. So the first sermon Jesus ever gives is he's calling forth this jubilee. That's what the word is. Okay. Yeah, you may have heard it in political arenas, even like uh, some African leaders call for the year of Jubilee, you know, like the cancellation of African debt. In 2000? Yes. That was a political thing in the year 2000? Okay. Um, yeah. To eliminate all the, the poorest countries' debt. Yes, that's right. The poorest 20 countries' debt or something. Uh, yeah. Yeah, and there was a big push for that. But I wonder what would that year of Jubilee, because you mentioned bringing that into the church, what would that look like? A year of Jubilee? Yeah, a, you, that principle of the year of Jubilee. What would it look like? here, right here, right now? Well, uh, perhaps your example of the, the African debt on a, on a global political level, I think that could be where the biggest changes are, are offered. So nothing specifically for us here? Well, it, it depends on, on how an individual's uh, life is, is changed, uh, you know, for that. So anyone who loses debt is changed, I would imagine. Yeah. Unless they're a gambler. Yeah. So I, I think it does work. So in one of the other sermons, I give that example of the chap in America who started a company and out of his own, he decided to lift the minimum wage mm. of, mm. His, of his people. Employees. Mm -hmm. He self-imposed mm. a, a minimum wage. Mm. And all kinds of unplanned side effects happened, if you like. So their, their debt was cancelled. There was a lot, they owed less money because mm. they had more wages to um, pay it off. A lot of them could give up a second job. Some were holding down two jobs uh, just to survive. And uh, there was a baby boom. Now, if you've got a, a livable income, you feel confident enough to, to start a family. So, mm. so there was a baby boom and many of them entered into the the home market for the first time they had enough resource to, to to buy a home so this is one person's life who's changed by similar concepts that because of his position of influence um, has th that company I would call a kingdom of God company um, for example it's almost becoming a political a political Transference, isn't it? I mean, lifting the wages, like the macadamia farmers or the blueberry farmers all mm. increase their wages. Um, it's merging religion with politics, do you think? Well, it's not, well, the religion that Je Jesus doesn't offer a religion. I, I hesitate around the word yeah. religion because I suppose he's influenced by his religious tradition, but True religion is ultimately political. Otherwise, what's mm, the point? Mm, what's the absolutely. use? Mm. Yeah. So uh, I, I do see elements of that kind of jubilee practiced within my parishioners. So, for example, I've got some parishioners who, out of their own, have just rewilded parts of the property they own. Mm -hmm. You know, just given it back to yep. the forest that it it once was. Several of them have done that. And it's quite a big movement in this area. Mm. Yeah. But, but that I would call a kingdom of God practice. Yeah. Land it's, for wildlife. Yep. Mm. And the thing is, as healing as it is for the environment, I would suggest that it's twice as healing for the individuals that have made that decision mm -hmm. uh, to do that. As the forest has grown, so have their inner beings uh, grown with that as well. So, and their health's improved by pulling weeds. So, you know, it's a <laughs> yes. Yeah. So that would, if I had to look for an example close by, 
example mm, I would give. It's an interesting one. Mm. Is yeah. people giving the land back to the ra the rainforest? Because mm. mm. there's other things you could do with that land. Sure. Absolutely. You could divide it and mm. sell it off, or mm. you know, try to make money out of it. But mm. they've decided they've got enough, and therefore. They're gifting the excess. That's the, that's why there's no rich in the kingdom of God, is because the rich willingly and for their own healing gift their excess. Okay. Mm. Yeah. And they are healed and the poor are healed. So it's a situation thing. It's yep. It's Jesus speaks mostly about day-to-day -day stuff. And because it's so challenging. So the people in this parish who've gifted land back to the rainforest, that's a jubilee practice, that's a kingdom of God practice. Absolutely. Mm. I think the other thing is we've just in the last couple of days had a really recent example of that where um, people won the Nobel Prize, I can't remember which one, but pr 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 proving e the economics um, will not fall over if you raise the minimum wage. And in fact, the direct opposite happens. Exactly. And mm. so mm. people just actually, and that's completely, that's an example where um, even in Australia, we're constantly, as soon as anybody starts talking about raising the minimum wage, the first thing um, the Business Council comes out with is it's going to send businesses t to the wall. And I've been listening to that for a very long time and I've never seen businesses sent to the wall because mm. of this, but it's the same argument they tried out every single time. And now we have this, um, wonderful Nobel Prize on literature research, quite well done research that clearly says this is a nonsense, not true. So it's about bucking the trend, isn't it? Yes. Um, and people don't like it when somebody sticks their head above the parapet, really? No, no, so that, that's precisely what the kingdom of God is about. It's about bucking the trend and people feel threatened by that and they want to bring you back to the logical solution um, the logics of our, of the politics of our status quo, mm. and to emphasise that that works. Well, we're living in a time where we've got absolute proof it doesn't work. You know, the climate's in a disaster. Um, you know, it's capitalism's fault lines were clearly shown when we mm. all went into lockdown. It's an extremely fragile way to, to, to do life. So, mm. so you're absolutely right. Um, the greatest threat to the kingdom of God in Australia is our wealth. Okay. Yeah, so he's not saying the wealth can't enter, enter the kingdom of God. He says at the end with God, anything is possible. But he's saying we're in deep trouble, so. Mm. Isn't that a contradiction though? All the way, you know, there's, um, words around, um, you know, that it's, uh, sorry, I'll, I'll probably misquote this, but, um, you know, a camel through a narrow space, that's the odds of, of a rich yeah, man getting right. there. In other words, saying, not going to happen. Yes. Um, you know, so isn't that a contradiction then? That, that he's saying, um, never going to happen, mm. and then says, oh, well, it's okay, because anything's possible with God, yes. Um, so I think part of that is also just understanding the background of the early listeners. So mm -hmm. as some people still do today, uh, their, their kind of current philosophy was that if you are healthy and wealthy, that's a sign of blessing from God. Okay. Um, so like I was in India and uh, there was a, a lady on the street that was just wailing. It was the most awful wailing I'd ever heard. And I couldn't understand why no one was going to help her. And mm. I stepped forward, and obviously I can't speak uh, Karnataka, which was the language of the time, so I was unable to, yeah. to help her. But wh why do people just ignore her? And the reason is, is that the local philosophy is one of karma. It's a hugely Hindu place, and that's her karma. You know, so that's, that's for her to deal with. So in, in that time, and I still think there's a hangover today, the, the, the sick and the poor uh, were blamed for their illness and their poverty. They must have done something wrong to be punished uh, like this. So 
part of it is, uh, is the shock of this reverse philosophy saying that it's actually not the poor that are to blame for their poverty. It's the rich and the systems that are structured to help the rich get richer at the expense of the poor being poorer. Mm -hmm. So the big example in Australia is up until the, the pandemic, uh, you know, the, those on the dole were, were quite hammered, I think, you know, because it's their fault if they can't get a job. It's their fault if they can't earn a wage. Yeah. Then we have the pandemic and a lot of people lose their jobs. Is it, is it their fault that they lost their jobs? Is it their fault that they no longer have an income? And people go, no, it's a pandemic. They can't help it. But to apply that same logic to how they imagined the poor before is... Is, is interesting. So that, that's the But they've the gone back to blaming there. them because they've halved the, they've yes. halved the support. So that, they've gone back to blaming them. That, that's exactly right. So <laughs> yeah. didn't last long. There, there was some really good research from Anglicare that showed we don't have a trickle-down economy. We have a trickle-up economy and how the poor actually pay for the rich. Imagine, imagine your home. I don't know if you've ever done this, but when I've done a huge tidy up and I've got, got all these clothes that have piled up and... I haven't worn for a while, but they're in really great condition. And maybe I haven't worn them for a while because I've had to buy new sizes. Let's just leave it at that. <laughs> I don't know if you have the experience of packing that, taking it to an op shop and having a sense of freedom. You, you feel psychologically lighter, don't oh, you? I, I did my whole house last year when I repainted it. <laughs> Yes, and how so did you feel a, afterwards? There was an awful, I met, an, well, it was really interesting. The, the biggest joy I got out of it was all these lovely people that I met. I have one at Wendy's Baskets. Okay. Just um, through giving away your through excess? Giving, through giving sharing it away it. or sharing it or, you know, selling it for ridiculously, you know, honestly, why did I put a price on this type um, mm -hmm. thing? And it just was, there was such joy in those people that, people that I met. And I've got a tidy, you know, a tidy cupboards. Yeah. Which are lovely. Yeah. I like tidiness. So, so one of the characteristics of the kingdom of God is this joy. Yeah. Which is more, which is more stable than the effervescence of happiness. You know, happiness can bubble away, but that that joy is still with you today. Yeah. Still giving things away. <laughs> Do you think there's? I mean, so that's the kingdom of yeah. God. So yeah. I don't think he's imagining that we'd be poor. Poverty is never the will of God, not for the poor mm. and not for anyone. Mm. What about those churches that preach um, the prosperity, you know, mm. like really God wants you to be rich? Yes. Is that like the opposite of what you're saying? It's precisely <laughs> the opposite. Mm. Mm. So where does that fit with this teaching? Because they, 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 they use the same texts. Oh, they use other texts and only part of it. <laughs> right. um, I can't think of, of anything authentic within the Gospels that would support the, the lifestyle of the, of the perhaps, rich. Perhaps it's more going back to the Jewish texts, the uh, Old Testament texts of, you know, God wants you to be, if it, you're blessed if you're rich, you know. I can't think of a verse that says that. Well, but well if God blesses us, <clears throat> God always blesses us to bless others. Mm. So if you have the blessing of wealth, you've got a huge burden of blessing on, on mm. how you use that for God. Mm. Well, so when Jesus talks about the kingdom of God, it's not about eternal life. No. It's about the here and now. Mm. So the kingdom of God is, you know, this realm where the values of Jesus are the constitution and are the economic policy, policy you know, in kindness, care for the mm -hmm. most vulnerable, tenderness. So the, the rich man, the inheritance, it prepares us because, see, what was happening at the time, and maybe it's similar in Australia today, was... Uh, you were given, you had land and you had to pay tax to the temple and tax to the Romans and whatever. 
and you would run out of resources to pay the tax. So you would take out a loan mm -hmm. and the surety for the loan would be your land. So these wealthy people who lent you the money, you could, if you couldn't pay the tax the first year, what makes you think you're gonna pay it the second year? So what happens is they have to forfeit their land mm -hmm. to this rich man. So the text is implying that he's one of these estate owners who's made his wealth by uh, capturing, you know, the land of of others in this in this uh, debt system, and it wouldn't just be him; it would be his ancestors before him. So there's we hear at the end of the text that he turned away from the kingdom of God because he had many. The gospels say many things, but it's actually many properties. Um, sorry, a question just popped into my head and pops straight back out. So how? So, so that's an example for the day. But how does that apply to Australia? Because I immediately thought of banks when you were talking about loans exactly and whatever. Right. Um, but um, you know, but aside from banks, how does that how does that work apply today? How does what? Apply? How does that whole um, you know that eternal life is the is is what we're all after. Um, so how, but it's not, um, okay, so if eternal life is what we're all after, is that, is that actually statement still true today? Is that what people are aspiring to? So I think, um, Wendy, that's one of the misconceptions about Christianity. And one of the misconceptions about Christianity, as I see it, is that it's, it's all about the hereafter, you know, mm -hmm. in getting enough brownie points uh, to yep. go to heaven one day. Do you think that's a historical thing? Do you think that the perception that you're giving us now is, you know, only been around maybe for half a century or so? Like, or a century maybe? No, maybe not. I, I, think, <clears> I think that perspective happens when you put the gospel in the hands of the rich. So a good way to avoid some of the radical teachings of Jesus is to spiritualize it, to say, oh, it's not about the banks. You know, heaven forbid we, <laughs> you know, the banks, and heaven forbid we have, a, have an ICAC. You know, it's nothing to do with that. It's about heaven. So the spiritualization of the gospel and forcing, um, forcing the view to be about whether you go to heaven or hell I think is is a, a wicked manipulation uh, that the wealthy do to avoid the radical teaching of the text, and it's also a useful way to uh, keep the poor in their place, promising you know. them something better when they die. Yes. Yeah, so don't worry about your suffering. Work another ten hours, and yes, it's not good now, but don't worry if you do this without complaining, you'll get to go to heaven one day. It's why Karl Marx said that religion is the, is the opium um, of the masses. So following the teachings of Jesus, I see him as very anti-religious and anti-establishment. And it really is about where the rubber hits the road here and now. That answers that question. Yeah, just curious. Yep, because we had a little discussion last night about whether that's something that the whole idea of eternal life of any description. And I just was horrified by the whole concept. I just thought that was an awful concept. That that it eternally somehow <coughs> you pass an exam, I would continue to exist. Yeah, they they make they made movies where people die, live forever, and they. They it's not good. Well, <laughs> I, I wondered what today. It really well, I might just life. I might just point out there before we come to sorry, Kathy, is that there's a very powerful moment in this text because Jesus pauses and he looks at him and mm -hmm. he really loves him. You know, mm -hmm. so I think that's quite a powerful moment. So, um, if anyone failed an exam, it's this guy, <laughs> but he's already loved and accepted. But he's not going to get eternal life. No, I think. I don't think it's about he. Well, possibly not because well, God, Jesus God, God could always. Enough. Are you no. saying Jesus' love is not strong enough so, for him to be moved? 
Is it to, to that, that point? point? So I would just say, and I would just say, everyone has eternal life, if, if that's what the thing is. So that's a non-question, do you know? Okay. So etern you can't equate eternal life with the kingdom of God. Okay. Um, it's only one dimension um, of it. We didn't talk about it here. No, we didn't. No. <laughs> we were just, yes. That's yeah. our story. <laughs> yeah. Sequel. So uh, this, this text is not about who goes to heaven and who doesn't. I'm out Thank of you. questions. Are you out of questions? Good. Well, it's good enough. I think it's long enough. Well, yeah, I think it's long enough. <laughs> <laughs> you got that, Chop? Now we have to wait till it's turned off before we say anything of significance. Not that that wasn't. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Really good questions.